Right, good evening everybody. It's good to, good to see you all here tonight. Um, just for the benefit of uh, members of the public, in a case of a fire, uh, a bell will ring continuously. If this occurs, please leave the building immediately, following the green fire exit signs out to the assembly point, which is by the War Memorial in Duke Street. Uh, if you need assistance, let us know. Don't use the lifts and remain at the assembly point and don't return to the building until you've been advised that it's safe to do so. Anyone attending this meeting is entitled to film it, but it should be pointed out that only councillors, officers and anyone sitting around these tables uh, may be filmed. Members of the public should not be filmed, so please ensure that cameras are pointed only in this direction. Please make sure that you've silenced or switched off your mobile phones. Thank you very much. Okay, so apologies. Uh, thank you, Chair. I've had apologies from Councillor Roberts and Councillor Bentley subbing for him, and also apologies from Councillor Pooley. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you. And then the minutes of the last meeting. Does anybody have any comments or? No? Take those as being correct. Thank you. Okay, I'm not aware that there are any public questions unless you've got a sudden burning ambition to, uh, to raise one. Uh, All right. Uh -huh. it's, it's, it's your discretion. Yes, okay. Yep, thank you.
written, and obviously you can see that obviously we do share some of your concerns. I don't know if an officer wants to respond at this stage or... I think uh, it would probably be best to respond at the, when we have the presentation, where we have the slides up. That would probably be a better chair. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, um, um, Mr. Chair. Um, so this item um, before you today is, um, I mean, essentially the purpose of this report is to outline um, the draft um, impact report, um, which as a host authority, each one of those host authorities, which include Braintree and Colchester and just a very, very small bit of Malden, um, this scheme, the A12 widening scheme, um, effects um, and effectively this um, is a nationally significant infrastructure project um, in relation to um, um, the development consent order process so this isn't an application that's being submitted to um, um, Chelsea City Council this is National Highways submitting this to the planning inspectorate through the development consent order now members will be familiar those that are on the committee that dealt with Longfield Solar Farm. So it's the same situation as Longfield in the sense that we, as local authority and host authority, have the opportunity to, uh, to comment. So the report has a number of recommendations, which is on the first page. Um, so I'm just going to go through this first slide, just sets out the extent um, of the A12 uh, widening scheme. Um, and um, effectively, as it, as it says, it goes from Boreham, Boreham Interchange Junction 19, all the way up to the Marks Tay Junction on, of the A12. Now, it is a scheme, it's an over, over a billion pound scheme that is being proposed by National Highways to effectively um, widen its, um, uh, the whole of that route to three lane dual. And, through that process, um, there has been some rationalisation of some of the junctions. Now, in terms of Chelmsford's, um, the actual scope of those, um, I think, 15 miles that you can see on the slide there is relatively small in the sense that um, the proposals are um, in that south western um, corner from Boreham Interchange Junction 19 up to our boundary, which is in between Boreham and Hatfield Peveril. Um, and the general proposal, uh, as I said, is a, is a nationally significant infrastructure pro pro um, project, and it follows those DCO processes. And as I said, it's the widening to three lanes. It's the bypasses of some junctions outside of our area, um, predominantly within um, Braintree and in um, Colchester. There's six new bridges for walking uh, walkers, cyclists, and horde riders. Um, one of the things that... Um, um, we're told is that um, they want to, the, this is National Highways, where you want to address the safety improvements. So that's one of the big factors in terms of this investment. It's not just about traffic flow, it's about making things safer. And then there's a whole host of associated works, as you can imagine, on a scheme of this scale. Um, so what I wanted to focus on, first of all, is the southernmost area and... Um, this is junction 19, so on there, on the screen, you probably, I'm sorry, apologies that the uh, tags are very small, but you'll see that um, um, effectively there are um, some proposals for um, junction 19. Now, what's being proposed is in addition to the developers' proposals that are actually happening at the moment. So anyone that's driven through Junction 19 at the moment um, will know that there's lots um, happening at Junction 19, and that's predominantly, well, solely related to the Bewley development and the radial distributor road. But what's actually going to, what's actually proposed as part of this development consent order is that there would be additional improvements to um, 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 Boreham Interchange. Um, 
back, I'm sorry, additional um, um, improvements to Boreham Interchange, and that would include the Boreham Bridge, so the bridge that goes across would be widened um, to uh, allow additional flows, and including its approaches and exits. Um, there's a, a construction of a new signal control crossing. Um, there's a construction of a new walking and cycling and horse bridge um, to uh, the northeast of um, the, 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 the actual interchange that goes from Payne's Lane. Um, and there's some signage, signage improvements as well and overhead gantry works and road surface improvements to the southbound carriageway. So effectively, what we've got here on Junction 19 is in addition to the works, as I say, that have been carried out by countryside properties in relation to um, Bewley. And I think I just wanted to put on that, that's a drone footage of, uh, of, the, of the junction um, about nine days ago. Um, so you can see that quite a lot of the works have already happened um, on Borough Interchange. And in the distance there, you probably, not sure you probably can see it, but you can see the bridge um, that actually over the last couple of nights um, has been slowly working its way across the railway uh, line. Um, and uh, you can see that it's slowly, very slowly, being shunted across the railway line there. And these are the, this is the radial distributor road. This is the existing junction improvements as part of Bewley. So in terms of um, the general arrangement in terms of Boreham and Hatfield Peveril, which I think is the points that Mr. Martin and Mr. Um, Carl were, uh, were, were picking up. Um, the proposal is to close both northbound and southbound junctions, that's junctions 20A and 20B at Hatfield Peveril. So for just to get your orientation as you're going up towards Hatfield Peveril, there's a left-hand lane which solely goes over and um, goes exits to um, Hatfield Peveril. And likewise, coming southbound, there is a slip road um, 20A that um, was referred to in relation to um, um, some of um, uh, the southbound um, works um, in relation to a very short, it is quite a short slip road. Um, and one of the reasons why um, um, effectively those are being closed in, in relation to the National, Highway, National Highways position is that what they want to do is consolidate junctions into, into one place in one, and having at-grade junctions um, accessing all areas. So what is being proposed is that those two junctions are replaced with a new junction to the northeast of uh, Hatfield Peveril, um, and that would be a, a junction that uh, relates to um, all uh, movements, both southbound and, and northbound. Apologies for this. It seems that it keeps on moving on on its own, and I'm not absolutely sure why it's doing that. But anyway, there we are. Maybe I'll be timed out. Um, so, um, and also the mitigation that is being proposed at the moment, and rightly said uh, by Mr. Uh, Martin, was that um, there's a reduction in speed limit to 30 miles an hour. So the main issue here is that traffic comes from Malden, that comes along the Malden Road at Hatfield Peveril. Um, at the moment, it turns left if it's coming wants to get southbound onto the A12. Um, then it joins uh, the A12 at Junction 20A, which is a small southbound slip, and that avoids any traffic going through Boreham, basically. Um, with the removal of that, um, um, removal of that um, um, junction, then we have a situation where um, um, traffic may well route all the way along Main Road and go to the Boreham Interchange that way, because if you're coming from Malden, it feels wrong to be going in the wrong direction if that makes sense. You're going probably three quarters of a mile north, uh, northeast and then to go back on yourself on, on the A12. And people are familiar with the route that they've taken for a while. And this is the points that we've been putting into national highways for uh, quite a significant amount of time. I'm going to move on to the next slide because <laughs> it keeps on wanting to go there. So the main issues, the key issues are, you know, the principle of development, the effect on Boreham, uh, the residents and businesses of Boreham, um, the construction of that walking and cycling and horse bridge, and just making sure that um, we are ensuring that all these proposals are within the environmental impact regulations. So um, things like noise and air quality, all of those sorts of things need to be, need to be um, looked at. 
So in terms of the principle of development, I think it's probably widely known that um, the A12 is a really busy road. Um, I think it's in, I think actually it's one of the, one of the most, it's the worst performing or within the 10% of the worst performing uh, links um, of the A12 there uh, within the whole of the network of the east of England. And we've all probably experienced um, driving on the A12 when anything goes wrong um, or even when, you know, at peak, um, there's some significant issues in relation to capacity and flow. Um, so I think in general terms, the, um, the, the, the improvements are welcomed. Um, it's at capacity and this, these proposals will lead to a reduction in congestion and reduced journey times. Um, and without any improvements, we know that that congestion and the, that journey time issues are, going, are likely to worsen. So I think in principle, I don't think um, officers have a, an issue. I think the main problems that we have been facing is precisely the, the, what you've heard tonight from members of the public is that we feel that um, in themselves, um, these proposals can be, could be quite well, potentially harmful to the residents of, of, of Boreham. And what we want to do is make sure that uh, mitigation is targeted and, and isn't a standard mitigation, at, you know, speed limit, as Mr. Martin um, pointed out. There needs to be a really comprehensive package of mitigation to ensure that we don't have a situation where um, traffic is rerouting through Borum. So it may well be um, things like average speed cameras. They can be more effective than um, uh, speed limits. Um, we can have physical um, you know, chicanes and barriers. There are a whole series of different package that, packages that will deter people from turning left. Because if it takes longer and it's more, uh, you know, it's more awkward, then people are less more likely to reroute and to change their travel, travel patterns. Um, in terms of Junction 19, um, we feel that the alterations are acceptable. Um, but as we said, the closures of 20A and 20B are expected to lead to an increase in traffic through Boreham. The other thing that I just wanted to pick up on that is in the officer's report is that we really welcome the new bridge. Um, I think we are probably um, um, not overly impressed with its design at the moment, um, quite utilitarian, um, and we feel that that bridge as, a, as an entranceway and uh, an opportunity to link into the new business park, the new railway station, and all uh, of the... Uh, benefits that the garden community brings, we feel that that bridge should be designed in such a way to recognise um, all of those things that are happening around it, rather than being, um, you know, something you would expect to see anywhere in the country. So we will be pushing hard to make sure that, you know, there's some, um, there's some changes in terms of that um, design. Um, I'm not going to bother you too much with the environmental statement. Um, there are um, many things that we need to undertake in terms of cultural, visual amenity, um, heritage, biodiversity, geology, um, noise and vibration. So we need to make sure that their environment statement is, um, you know, picking up all of those things and we will be interrogating, uh, interrogating that um, more through, through the process. So the development consent order, um, as we said, it's a, a nationally significant infrastructure project. The process has to be determined by the Secretary of State. Um, the host authorities and the interested and statutory parties um, have a status. They, we have a, a different status from um, other members of the public or other bodies because we're a host authority. And what we do is we submit a local impact report. And that is what's appended as uh, Appendix 1 of of your report, our draft local impact report. Now, we don't, we have a bit of time before we have to uh, finalise this um, because the re relevant representations run until uh, the 4th of November. Um, but what we want to do is we want to ensure that um, we put on notice, um, National Highways, that we do have some um, issues in relation to some of the, some of the detail. 
Um, and I think the main issue that really is the effects on Borum is the thing that we really want to get right and make sure that that mitigation package um, is put in place. Now, I think one thing that I would like to say is that 20A, one of the things that we uh, have put to national highways through the probably the last three or four years is whether there is an alternative to um, providing an all movement junction to the to the northeast of of, of uh, Hatfield Peveril. Uh, the answers that we've had back so far is that um, that isn't possible, um, purely mainly because of safety um, in relation to um, traffic's turning right onto a slip road. That slip road at the moment it would be, um, you know, a substandard slip road. Um, it wouldn't be um, allowed um, within the existing constraints of of the scheme. So that's what we're being told at the moment, that the D, that's the reason why the DCO doesn't actually include, um, include those proposals. Now, I'm not actually sure why the screen has gone black. <laughs> black um, I'm going to just try and carry on talking while Daniel um, has, a, has a look at that. So um, what, we're, what the next steps um, are, yes. So the next steps are... Um, we have um, a preliminary meeting on the examination um, likely in December, January. Um, we think the, exa the examination will start um, potentially, um, the examination process will start at the beginning of next year, but the actual, um, the actual um, submissions and hearings are likely to be later on in the year. Um, but I think what we would like to do is to get that submission of that local impact report in as, as quickly as we can with your, with your approval. And obviously that's the detail of that is delegated to um, the director and the cabinet member for sustainable development. Um, and the scheduled decision on, on this is likely to be towards the end of next year. Thank you for your patience <laughs> uh, in terms of some of the technology. They're not quite going quite to, quite to plan. But um, I'm hoping that the recommendations that are put forward on the beginning of the uh, report um, sets out what officers' proposals are. The draft impact report is appended at, uh, at Appendix 1. And I'll go back to you, Chair, for uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Councillor Massey. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr Potter. Um, further to what the gentleman said earlier, I, I was going through and I, it did um, trigger something that I do recall reading. And actually 7.4 in the appendix does say explicitly, what is required is a package of measures to make the route unattractive and to encourage users to use the new junction. So we have got it in there. If you want to make that sentence maybe more forceful, like extremely unattractive, <laughs> I don't know. But it, we have, it has been picked up already, so um, we're on the, on, I think we're on the game there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's the solution. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, I, got, I could ask a couple of questions. Around about um, the Junction 19, is the three lanes actually going to go through Junction 19, um, which is extremely busy, and then when you, as you come on, uh, which I frequently do because my father lives in Boreham, uh, in fact, perhaps just in case anyone doubts, his house backs onto Main Road. He is coming up to 101, so I don't think he'll care very much about this. But um, um, so, um, yeah, it, the, you have uh, Junction 19, uh, and then I mean, one of the eccentricities. Uh, I support the widening of that piece, but of course, the A12 bypass around Chelmsford is two lane, and it's not only the A12; it's the A130 or the A414 as well. Um, um, so um, I don't know about the traffic numbers, but it, it, it can grind to a halt. Um, so I don't know. It may improve the congestion through the, the stretch that's improved, only to uh, snarl up around Chumpsford. The other question that um, I, I'd like to, and it relates to Junction 19, the northeast bypass, will that come in, in, in as a separate entity into this Borum Junction 19? Um, and uh, well, if it does, and it looks as if they'll be building one thing, and I mean, they've had three bites at this junction 19. The one, the work of the developer, if they're doing the northeast bypass, um, then there'll be uh, another bite, and then this, or whichever, maybe the other way around. 
Um, Liz, thank you. Um, so, um, first of all, Junction 19, there is no proposals to make it um, three lane to the, to the south of Junction 19. It's, all, it's, it's three lane to uh, the northeast of Junction 19. It, it, will, it will stop, actually, yeah, as the slips come on going northbound, it will go on to three lanes, but going southbound, it will go from three to two. Um, and I, I, I share your um, surprise at the fact that um, the Chelmsford Bypass wasn't included in the proposals in the first place, but I'm afraid um, we've made that point on a number of occasions, the National Highways, and, uh, but this is the scheme that they've submitted. Um, in terms of the um, Chelmsford North East Bypass, um, so the first, the phase of the bypass that is funded connects, doesn't actually connect onto the A12, it connects onto the radial distributor road, the road that's going around um, Bewley, that, that, the bridge that I showed you the photos is the last missing part of that. So at this point in time, there aren't any further proposals for duelling the whole of the Chelmsford North East Bypass. So um, the Junction 19 would need to change if in the future there was a, fuel, a full duel of the Junction 19 connecting um, A12, the A12 with the A130 as it, or the A131 as it will be um, in terms of the um, Chelmsford uh, North East Bypass. So I think... Um, that is a uh, future that is unknown at the moment, I'm afraid, Councillor Sosin. Uh, there was an additional question, which the government has proposed fast tracking certain highways. You mentioned the timetables there. Uh, I guess uh, you can't know that, um, but I guess it's conceivable that this, uh, that process could be fast tracked if the government wishes to go in that direction. Well, they don't need money. Um, I mean, at this point in time, no, I, I don't know, I'm afraid. I'm so <laughs> Councillor Willis. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I fully um, follow what's being said, and the, the junctions in um, Hatfield, Peveril, and, and along towards Boreham, um, with which I have in the past been quite familiar. Um, I'm conscious that at the same time there has been an issue that every now and again somebody has managed to ignore all the signs and in crossing over the A12 or approaching on the road that would take you over the A12 they have insisted on turning right, turning right or rather because they've been on a, another road they, they carry straight on and come down onto the left-hand carriageway of the A12, but driving in the wrong direction. I take it that this, these changes will make that quite impossible. I mean, I, I, obviously, driver behaviour is quite good. <laughs> How can I put it? Um, um, you know, the design of it will be designed in such a way to minimise that, and obviously signage as well. But, I mean, I... I I couldn't say impossible because it's down to <laughs> each driver. You'd have to close it off, <laughs> yeah. wouldn't you? And you yeah. can't do that because you've got to allow traffic to come that, off the That's right, yeah. Cross. But, yeah. I mean, the design would be at a standard to ensure that that is minimised and also signage, making sure that um, yeah. signage um, minimises that impact. Okay, thank you. That's all I had. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I guess there's nobody here who disagrees with what we're going to say anyway. Uh, and we entirely support uh, what's said there. Uh, you haven't uh, entirely clarified my understanding, anyway, of the need to build a new junction at all, um, because we have junctions that are not, apart from odd things, uh, problems in life at the moment. I mean, where you go up and down the road, those are the two junctions that don't cause any problems, really. It's the Boreham Interchange clearly has always been the one. Can we not suggest to the government they can save money here by not building a, a new one and carry on with two existing ones which aren't a problem? Because it's only 2042 or something they become a problem. So why don't they save money now and not build a junction that nobody wants? Uh, and why don't we say that in our comments? Good point. 
I mean, that is up for members to um, obviously, if that is the um, the, the feeling of the, <laughs> of the board. I mean, what's been put to us is that um, through the process of changing all of all of these highways, what we've got to remember is that the A12 is a combination of changes that have happened over the last you know 50 years, all at different standards, all at different times. Um, and because of that, there, it is a real hodgepodge of design and safety. Now, the main driving reason behind changing and moving 20A in particular is safety. Um, and um, the modelling that has that accompanies um, um, the proposals, the DCO, seeks to say that effectively having one junction is better in flow and capacity and safety terms, and that's the reason why um, that's being proposed um, and through the DCO. So, I mean, we can look at that in more detail in relation to the, that decision-making, but I think I would just say to members that I would suggest that it's unlikely that the DC, that N National Highways would change their proposals because of those predominantly safety factors that they're quoting back to us. Are there any accident statistics to prove all of this then? Have we seen any of those? Because, again, uh, there, there appears to be a lack of background, which presumably you've seen. And I, I don't think members want to see piles of paper like that either. But nonetheless, if, if it's a safety problem, there should be statistics to show. It's like putting in crossings. They only put them in after people have been killed of them, don't they? I mean, it's, we, we know that over years. Um, are there statistics to, to back this up? There are safety um, statistics. Um, I mean, the, the slip road is substandard, it's too short, and um, at peak and at times of congestion, um, you know, there has been accidents on that slip. Um, in terms of how bad that slip is in relation to the number of accidents, that's a, that's a judgment that, you know, National Highways is the as the kind of um, as the body that's looking after the trunk road system have to call, um, but I mean the widening process is an opportunity to along that stretch is to get everything up to standard. That's what national highways are proposing: is not to leave substandard junctions on the network. Um, I comment on um, that junction. If you come out of Hatfield Peveril at the moment, you come in on that very slot slip road, but you come into the third lane which is an additional lane, if they widen it through Hatfield Peveril to three lanes, you will have only that minimal slip road to come into a fast third lane. Um, clearly, that's a problem. There might be other solutions to it, but that clearly I see as a problem uh, which you don't have at the moment because you have a, uh, a new third lane to go into at the moment from the very short slip road. Um, uh, uh, and I can see people raising that as a question, as a problem. I mean, as I said, um, the proposals are proposals that are going through the sort of national safety audit process, and therefore all the proposals will be seeking to improve safety um, from the existing road. And as I say, is to make sure that there's a consistent approach along that whole stretch. So um, they are the proposals of national highways, um, we as host authority can make our comments to those and that's the reason why this um, report is in, in front of you tonight. Well, hang on, one moment. I think they're still discussing. Yeah. Councillor Walsh? Yeah, I just wanted to say that it's, um, it's a bit kind of um, disappointing, really, that there's, there's currently work on Junction 19, this, and then there'll be the North East Bypass. And it's all in one area of the city that, you know, we've got a lot of commuter traffic coming down through for quite an extended period of time now, that if there was any way any of those developments could be, as Councillor Sosha mentioned, either fast-tracked or combined together. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kurt Walsh. Um, so our starting point was we were encouraging National Highways to do all the work to the junction in one hit. And we went through a number of uh, meetings with them. Unfortunately, um, 
the stars didn't align to allow the timetabling of that to happen. So countryside properties wanted to get on with their, their junction because, of course, they have a, a planning permission that restricts... Rest they need to open that road. Um, so um, national highways, um, unfortunately, missed that opportunity. Luckily... Um, the junction improvements to Junction 19 don't actually mean that you've got to dig up anything that's actually just been put in, which was our fear that as part of the countryside proposals, that would seem totally perverse, that in two, three years' time after that junction's open, for, to knock down something that's just been built. Luckily, um, what they've tried to, well, what they are uh, proposing and what they feel works on Junction 19 is complementary to the existing Junction 19 improvements by um, the developer. And therefore, the impact of that is going to be lessened, I would say. We will always look for ways in which we can try and combine um, and for, for all sorts of different reasons. But unfortunately, sometimes when you're looking at different projects being proposed by uh, different bodies for different reasons, um, trying to corral all of those into, uh, into doing the sensible thing that you're absolutely right sometimes can be quite tricky. But uh, we will continue to make sure that we look at things holistically and make sure that we um, try and encourage them to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Well, yes, well, I guess what we're saying to our officers is, you know, to seek to come up with creative ways of dealing. I mean, I, I would have thought that Junction 20A could be changed, you know, if you use, change the priority and use traffic lights, you know, there must be a way of improving Junction 20A to, to get traffic directly onto the A12 and then use traffic lights for the, for the local traffic. There must be options there. Um, but, yeah, but... Um, but are members happy that officers will have, have our full backing to uh, minimise the... A very brief second bite at the cherry, just for information. Um, according to Essex County Council, Junction 7A of the M11, which was recently competed, uh, cost around 78 million. That gives you an order of magnitude in terms of Councillor Whitehead's savings. Yeah. We, we can make um, those points. What we need to realise is that at some point, um, through the examination process, we um, will need to provide evidence um, um, to uh, an inspector, um, and we need to make sure um, that that evidence is robust. Um, so I just would caveat um, any changes with that with that with that statement. Thanks. Chair, shall I make the thank you? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so we have the two recommendations that we have considered. The the draft local impact report and to recommend to the director of sustainable communications in um, consultation with the cabinet member for sustainable to finalize the local impact report and enable it to be submitted to the planning inspectorate um, by some date or other and secondly to authorize the director of sustainable communities and its appointed officers to engage within and respond on behalf of Chelmsford city council on all matters relating to the examination and subsequently thereafter. So I propose that. Thank you. Seconded, Chair. Thank you. Members, happy with that recommendation? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jeremy. Okay, we go back then to the cathedral matter. There's Michael, are you leading? Thank you. Thank you for your consideration. Appreciate it. Um, good evening. Um, so the background for this um, the enhancement plan, um, it, the starting point really was the issues with um, pedestrianisation of Tyndall Square, um, which closes off the existing laybys on Tyndall Square, which the cathedral have historically enjoyed um, using for servicing the cathedral, particularly um, for hearses on days of funerals. Um, yeah, so Tyndall Square um, closes effectively um, as part of the pedestrianisation scheme, um, which loses the service laybys on Tyndall Square. Um, so that's a, a key driver for this project. Um, secondly, it's to allow for 
a coordinated management of the churchyard um, as part of a master plan. Um, it delivers the enhancement of a key um, city centre public space um, and it's the obvious kind of next step on from the Tyndall Square project um, and it satisfies the council's duties um, to enhance the conservation area. Um, so the, the cathedral itself was um, obviously built as a parish church, St Mary's Parish Church. Um, it was largely rebuilt in the early 15th century, um, replacing an 11th century church. Um, as you can see on the 1591 Walker map on the top left, um, the appearance of the church and the shape of the churchyard is largely um, the same today. Um, historically, the churchyard was um, crammed full of monuments and tombs and largely enclosed by railings um, and that character has been drastically changed um, from the 1970s when the churchyard was largely cleared of most of its monuments um, and the character of it today um, is much more dominated by trees as you can see from the recent um, aerial image bottom right. Um, so the cathedral uh, became um, from the parish church, the cathedral in 1914 um, when the diocese was reorganised. Um, so it's actually the second smallest cathedral in the country, um, but it occupies the second largest diocese in the country. Um, so the study area um, is, takes in the churchyard itself and the main spaces and approaches um, around the churchyard, largely defined by the building frontages um, and the the main approaches from, from Duke Street and Tyndall Square um, and parts of Leg Street. Um, it forms part of the setting to the Grade 1 listed cathedral um, and a number of other listed buildings around the churchyard including Shire Hall. Um, it's within the central conservation area um, and it's crossed by a, a number of public footpaths um, and as a closed churchyard it's maintained by Chelmsford City Council. Um, and it, Arguably it's the most attractive and historic uh, place within the city centre. Um, so the churchyard currently fulfils a number of functions, um, obviously for religious ceremonies, um, but also a busy thoroughfare through to the city centre um, for graduation ceremonies and other events, um, as public gardens um, and quite importantly as a, as a public park, particularly in the summer months. Um, so some of the current issues, um, I mean, the sort of would-be visitor arriving at Chelmsford Station and, and taking a trip along Duke Street um, and then arriving at the cathedral um, is granted with a, the site on the top left, so it's cluttered with signage and not particularly pleasing street furniture and tarmac surfaces, so it could be one of, you know, a great approach to the cathedral, but at the moment it, it doesn't really... Um, give a very befitting setting and approach to the cathedral itself. Um, there's a number of areas where there's poor quality paving and oversized trees. Um, and on the key approach to the south porch, um, there's exposed bins and backs of buildings on the, the area um, just off of Duke Street. Um, there's a number of um, routes across the churchyard which are well trodden, um, which are not paved at the moment, so it's kind of churned up and, and muddy. Um, there's an access at the um, southeast corner towards Waterloo Lane that's down some fairly narrow steep steps um, and centrally along New Street there's a very narrow and dangerous pedestrian access um, with steps directly into the, the roadway. Um, there's a very limited um, external public space at present, so there's a small widening of the paving um, adjacent to the south entrance, but other than that there's, there's no real public space within the churchyard. Um, there's a very narrow um, vehicle access off of Church Lane, which is too narrow to, to fit a hearse. Um, and then on the, the image on the right hand side, circled in green, is the, the laybys that are closed off as part of the Tyndall Tind Square scheme. Um, so most of the cathedral has fairly core quality paving material, so in the main it's tarmac and um, concrete slabs. Um, there's a mixture of 
poor quality street furniture that's been added kind of ad hoc over time so nothing matches um, and there's some inappropriate planting with these kind of mock palm trees dotted around the edge of the churchyard um, and there's areas where some of the fairly unattractive backs of buildings on Duke Street are, are exposed in key views and then there's some more attractive buildings which, which are screened. Um, so we've been working in partnership with the Cathedral um, and we appointed Wynne Williams Associates Landscape Architects um, to prepare a study for the, the Cathedral precinct area um, and we undertook a series of stakeholder workshops to inform the concept proposals. Um, so this is the, the concept plan. Um, so that proposes um, infrequent vehicle access off of New Street via um, Church Street, with, which would be controlled by bollards. Um, the dangerous access onto New Street is closed off. Um, there's an improved access at the, the southeast corner towards Waterloo Lane. Um, and there's a series of new public spaces um, to the southwest and east of the cathedral and also on just off of Duke Street on the main approach to the cathedral. Um, and there's improved cycle parking. Uh, there's new footpaths on the design lines across the churchyard, um, and improved paving and street furniture, um, and a new landscaping scheme and tree planting. Um, so this is the, the plan which um, largely introduces um, Yorkstone in the key public spaces and bound gravel um, footpaths elsewhere, um, a much simpler landscaping scheme to taking out all of the non-native planting uh, and really keeping it quite simple so the cathedral is the main focus of the churchyard. Um, so in terms of the next steps, um, the plan is to undertake a further series of stakeholder workshops um, including the, the Cathedral Authorities, um, Essex Highways and Historic England, um, undertake some public consultation work um, and then progress with a, a detailed design um, and then use that detailed design to apply for a faculty which is it's a bit like a planning permission, it's part of the Church of England approval process um, and then use that detailed design to seek funding um, and inform future maintenance and management proposals um, and then hopefully, um, once funding is achieved, um, to commence the scheme, either in its entirety or in phases. Um, so the recommendation this evening um, is that the Policy Board endorse the plan um, and delegate authority to the Director of Sustainable Communities in consultation with Cabinet members um, to progress with the detailed design. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Walsh. Hi. Yeah, I think probably when most people are um, reading the report and see the removal of trees, is there a proposal to plant a native tree in replacing some of the trees that would be removed as part of this? Yes, there is um, part of the scheme is to remove some trees, particularly um, there's some large conifer trees at the back of Shire Hall, which are quite a dominant feature in the churchyard. Um, and there's some other sort of non-native species that would be removed. Um, there's some conifer trees up just behind the um, chancel. Um, so as you can see on this, the landscaping plan on the scheme, um, there are a number, the, the dark green trees are basically the new planting. So um, the idea is to take out all the inappropriate trees and put back native trees and definitely put back more trees than there are now. Um, so yeah, there would definitely be a net increase in tree planting. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. So further points about the trees. The, I am concerned about the removal of the trees. Um, even if they um, are dominant and I mean, I've been experienced with a lot of your chumps of planting trees which have died in the extreme weather of this year. And you remove the trees <coughs> and they die. You talked about removing a palm tree. You might have to consider that as a kind of tree we might need, and uh, perhaps some olive trees, uh, rather than if you were to plant th these areas in here and they all fail uh, due to extreme weather, uh, when you're having had removed 
the, the, the established trees, of course, have a better chance of surviving. Um, the, uh, I don't know, the firs, they're uh, 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 more adapted to northern European than southern European climes. But um, I, I think one should bear that in mind as you progress your designs, uh, okay. this, uh, and consider that uh, I'm afraid we might have to move away from what are now native trees to trees from southern Europe. We may do. I mean, I, as you develop, other things might happen. But uh, that's just a concern that came to my, my mind. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, it's definitely a good point. The, um, I mean, the new landscaping will be designed to take account of future climate change. I suppose we're, and we're fortunate in that the churchyard is maintained by the city council, so um, we've got a very good track record of maintaining the flower beds and everything else there, so it's something that would be kind of maintained in-house, but it's, it's definitely something we would have to consider carefully in the detailed design. Councillor Knight. Thank you. What is the probable cost? Where does the money come from? And is the church contributing anything? Well, just ask my the most important question. Um, certainly, to, it's a partnership with the cathedral. So today, all the design work has been funded 50-50 with the cathedral and the city council. Um, so going forward, it, it would definitely still be a partnership arrangement. Um, we had the initial concept design costed by a quantity surveyor um, in February of this year. And at that time, it was circa 600,000. Um, obviously, the way things are going, that figure has almost certainly increased quite substantially. Um, but I think, I mean, the, the, the recommendation tonight is not to require any funding. The idea is when we've got a detailed design that will allow us to fundraise um, and working in partnership with the cathedral, um, because they're a charity that opens up various other doors for funding opportunities that, that, that will be open to us. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I think there have been some issues, I think I'm right in saying there's been issues in the past with rough sleeping on some of the benches around in the cathedral grounds. Um, and I, looking, from the, looking at the, uh, the report, it didn't look as though the proposed benches were sort of anti-sleep anti at all. Um, so w will there be some thought there in terms of um, trying to avoid that as an issue in the future? Thank you. Yes, I mean, historically that has been an issue within the churchyard. There were a number of benches on the northern side of the churchyard that were removed a few years ago because of that issue. Um, so the, the plan is to, to sort of position the benches and have a bench of a suitable design to try and minimise any, any issues of that nature, yes. OK, uh, thank you very much. Chair, I'll make the recommendations then. The Policy Board endorsed the Cathedral Precinct Enhancement Plan and the Policy Board delegate to the D Director of Sustainable Communities in the consultation with the Cabinet Members for Sustainable Development and Greener Chelmsford the responsibility to progress with a detailed design of this scheme. I propose that. Councillor Willis. Thank you, Chairman. Very briefly, um, and not to set aside in any way the uh, motion that's just been agreed. But in the uh, paper, there is um, excellent reference to the cathedral as a cultural centre. And the summary that was presented tonight omitted that. And I think it's an important function of the cathedral. Uh, it mentioned graduation ceremonies. And yes, indeed, there are some, in, um, mostly in the summer months. But... Um, Events take place throughout the year, concerts of all kinds, and a whole variety of other events. It's a very, very well-used space. Um, and I think we need to keep that in mind um, in terms of the access arrangements and so on. Thank you. Did you want to second the recommendation? Or? Yes. Okay. OK, members, members happy with the recommendation? Thank you. OK, so it comes to the work programme. Did you want to say anything? Or? Um, only just <coughs> to point out that our next meeting um, is not until the 3rd of November. Um, at the moment, um, we have 
a single item, um, which is Chelmsford Garden Community Development Framework document. Um, at this point in time, um, we're working very hard to ensure that that gets to the committee, uh, or the board, sorry. Um, but I suppose I just need to preface that with the fact that we also have a, a master plan for Great Lees happening at the same time. Um, so um, it, we're only going to want to have one master plan on a meeting. Um, so it, it, I'm just sort of uh, flagging up the, that the, it could well be uh, slightly uh, swapped if, if one gets to a further uh, point than the other. But at this point in time, um, I don't know what that um, outcome will be. So it's just to, to, just to flag that up. Thank you, Chair. Association? Yeah, Chair, the, I think um, many members of the public would like to see a, uh, as soon as possible, a scheduled date for the review of the adopted local plan, integrated impact assessment, uh, issues and options um, uh, consultation. Uh, so if the, I appreciate you, the um, officers have just said the big workload of the two items uh, just mentioned and other items. But um, if, if um, they get an idea, uh, people have asked me questions, you know, when it might happen. So, I mean, the first stage of that is actually programmed in, on the, in January on the work program. So it's the the strategic housing and employment land availability assessment. So the first thing um, this board will be looking at is all of those um, submissions in terms of land. Um, and then also in terms of the standing item underneath, um, there is reference to the review of the adopted plan and we will schedule in um, meeting dates um, um, in the new year um, for the consideration of the local plan. So, but at this stage, obviously, we extended the plan consultation until the 20th of October. Uh, we've got to look at all of the representations that will be submitted to us, analyse those to get those ahead uh, before you to ensure that you've got full visibility of what people were saying. Um, so that's the situation at the moment. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, any urgent business? Okay, thank you, members. Enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>